prodigal. The prodigal is welcome home, the sinner now a saint. For the God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Oh, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Our hearts 
worship of tonight. Y'all go ahead and be seated. Brother Todd. Amen. Don't sit down yet. You got to hug somebody's neck. You got to tell somebody Jesus loves them, and you got to tell somebody else your middle name. Kids, y'all did a great job tonight. Hope y'all have a good night in class. Oh, thank you. Amen. You didn't tell me your middle name, though, Danita. What? Oh, Joy? Straight Joy. You know I didn't know that. I, you got a child named Joy. Amen. Amen. We got so many kids, we're going to have to start hauling them out in a bus. Amen. Y'all been great bringing your kiddos, and they've been bringing y'all and everything else. If you got your Bible, get over to Daniel chapter 2. If you're online with us tonight, we're glad you're here. Stay with us. Now, these poor people are trapped in here, so you can't just turn it off anytime you want, right? You can't hit pause and go ruddle, muddle about and come back because they can't do that and break social convention. So... Amen. Y'all know what I do when I watch preaching, when I do, have to do a lesson on, online? I put it at twice the speed because you can still hear the people talking. But instead of the preacher taking an hour to preach, it only takes him 30 minutes. And I still hear it, Shannon. Don't you wish you could do that with me in here, just hit the fast-forward button like, come on, everybody. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you're here. Hope you're having a good week. Been an eventful week around Victory for the last couple of weeks. Just be praying so many things going on. Lots of people have asked about Brother Jim. Uh, he is doing much better. Uh, he, had, he had that surgery and began to come out of surgery talking about how much better he felt. And that's when you know you've been really down. I saw him yesterday. He, uh, he honestly looked better than he's looked in three months to me. But, but uh, be praying for his pathology report and all that. A lot of you have been asking about Brother Jimmy Montoya, who would be here tonight, had he not had a dear lady, bless her heart, hydroplane in front of him as he was coming out of Palestine on a job thing the other day. And um, uh, I have not heard about how she's doing. She was in very critical condition. But she hydroplaned and, and straight into Jimmy and uh, broke his kneecap uh, and if any of you know anything about Rex fireman police you know how hard you got to take a lick to break a kneecap I also broke his hand and so he got to spend all day today waiting on a surgery at 5 o'clock today and uh, they postponed it till 2 o'clock tomorrow so you know if I was there there would be a full blown food revolt going on right now for them not letting me eat but but, uh, but do be praying for Jimmy, man. I mean, you know, him and Kai Kai are as core here as any, any humans get. And praise God that he, he came through that because, um, I, like I say, I was in Dallas yesterday and people forgot how to drive in the rain. It is amazing to me how poor of drivers we are around here. I mean, really. I watch them Yankees run around in snow and ice and all that stuff. And I mean, unless they just completely hit a sheet of ice, they don't hit nothing. They don't wreck out. And then uh, we just lose our minds. If it ain't sunny in 75, we drive 100 miles an hour. We just sometimes don't know what we're doing. We're going to have to do better. Got to beat them Yankees, amen. So anyway, uh, but, uh, but, but if you can, and there are a lot of other things going on. Uh, uh, memory would, would fail, and we would not have time to talk about all the things going on. Uh, I did have a lot of people asking me right before it heard Mamma went to the hospital. She's back home, got a little fluid off of her. She's real tired. Her and Mimi decided to go to bed. So they went to bed about 6.30. And you know, they're old. Mamma's 96, Mimi's almost 80. So, um, you know, they're, uh, you like I tell Mimi all the time, she go complain about stuff. I say, you got to remember, you're just an old woman. And then uh, she starts telling me how Trey and Troy have always been her favorites. So anyway... Um, but but no, she's doing better. Y'all do y'all just keep praying and and praying for you know. Anytime you hear about things, uh, what you waving at me, or Adam? Oh, anybody need an outline? Amen. I think we ran out of them. I, I I don't think the copier printed all. It didn't feel like the number I'd printed off when I brought them over. So if you can, if you share around a little bit, make sure if somebody's got a 
um, just w maybe one per family right now, and then we'll, we'll move around. I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, Daniel chapter 2. Get over there in your Old Testament. If you hadn't got to be with us on Wednesday night or you just joined us online, uh, we're studying Daniel verse by verse uh, in 2023 as we kind of move into the year. Uh, we took a big, uh, big old gulp, big old bite out of chapter 1 last week. I want us to jump into chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 introduces us to the real uh, ideas and themes that go on in the book of Daniel. So much of Daniel is the stories, uh, the narrative of Daniel's life, the stories that you know, a fiery furnace, um, a, a, a lion's den, and those kinds of things. But in reality, Daniel, the, mainly the second part of Daniel, is very, very prophetic and uh and, and the book of Daniel is, frankly, the key to um, prophecy, especially the prophecy that we, you and I would live under. You cannot understand and have a good, firm, working grasp of the book of Revelation without having a grasp of what is going on in Daniel because while Revelation alludes to some things, Daniel is where we get a lot of... Um, a lot of detail about it and uh so it, it is a, an apocryphal type of, of prophecy we talked about that as we started talking about um uh, uh the book of daniel it the book of revelation uh, uh zephaniah others uh are uh use uh some very vivid imagery uh visions and things like that to talk about what's going to be happening going forward and in chapter two you you get into into both the realities I've talked about. The story of Daniel chapter 2 about Daniel interpreting dreams. We saw that in chapter 1 that God gave him the ability like Joseph had to interpret dreams and, uh, and then the reality that here in the book of Daniel we are going to be introduced to a vision that King Nebuchadnezzar who's the king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire has that is, that is um, a picture of world empires that were to come that even right now we are dealing with and under and so uh, visions that are going to be explained to us later in the book of Daniel uh, but things the book of Revelation talks about uh, lays out these these world systems one of the ways you can really learn to trust the Bible is not only in the fact that the promises about Jesus came to pass those messianic prophecies but promises and prophecies that God made about the world, in particular nations rising up and those kinds of things. Uh, or, or we, we see God makes a promise and then God keeps a promise. We look back at it and we go, huh, well, there's something there. God keeps his word. And, uh, and, it's, and, and chapter two is one, of, with others, is one of the great reasons why skeptics attack the book of Daniel like they have down through the years. Because it, 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 it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take much, I would say imagination, but interpretation to see what he talks about here, to see what he talks about in another vision of, of, of animals that he's going to see rising up. We're going to see these same, these same, uh, these same four kingdoms uh, coming to pass. But, uh, but it really it lays out like a road map. You know, the Bible says that the, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He moves it however he wants. And so you have to recognize that God does a lot of work in nations of people. You know, the nations are going to be judged one day. You and I are going to be judged as Christians. We're also going to be judged as Americans because all the nations, as it were, and all the times are going to come be, before the Lord. And the Lord seems to give um, uh, a, a, a national identity to people. We all tend to, uh, uh, you know, the only time I root for a soccer team is when the United States is in the, is in the World Cup. They don't usually last very long, but if they get in there, you know, I'm for them. I hate soccer, but I, I like it till then, right? And then when they lose, I don't care anymore. And so, but the only reason is because that, that's my identity. It's part, of, it's part of what we are. It's the same reason those of us that are from Texas are as proud as we are and then all of you who came got here as quickly as you could amen and uh so uh so there's just that uh that's there ramon makaloff a dear friend of mine who's in heaven now a palestinian christian there in, in jerusalem he told me when we were talking one day and, and he said where are you from and i said uh i said outside of dallas and he said is that texas i said texas and he said you texans i can always tell you he said any other american you ask them where are you from over here they say the states he said, y'all all say Texas. 
He said, you said Rosser. I said, amen. Well, ain't but few of us from there, and you might as well be proud. Amen. So, so you, you see that. Now, what we're going to do tonight, uh, Daniel chapter 2 is a lengthy chapter in and of itself, um, but um, uh, going through about 45 verses. But what, uh, but what we're going to do tonight is I want to give you kind of an overview of the chapter, and then we are gonna, we're going to probably take a couple of weeks and really work into this vision uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, because of the interpretation is given by the Lord. And it really affects not just then, but now. Uh, and, and so, uh, especially these times that we're living in. You know, I always, I've always figured I've kind of been living in the last days. But boy, the last few years, if anything else, have, have amplified uh, uh, that reality. The things that we see now are, are just coming to such an an impossibility and a delusional end. I, I found out today that math um, uh, math is homophobic, based on what some experts are saying that, that get paid to be experts, and um, and it, that this makes sense somewhere. And uh, since your gas stove is going to take over the world and become the antichrist, I thought perhaps. <laughs> We might take a good close look at the last days. I, I'm not making this up. Amen, Amen. Amen. I'm not making this up. And so, uh, let us begin the journey. All right, now again, I didn't put all the scripture because we're going to glance through the whole uh, of J Daniel 2 and 45 verses um, would be more than I could put on here and, 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 and keep you to a page or so. So let's just start with what it is. In the second year, verse 1 of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. And if you'll just, if you got your Bible open there, or there on the, on, the, on the screen, I imagine, um, it says, The king gave command to call all the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. Now, who is this group and what's the difference in them? They're all basically doing the same thing. These are soothsayers. These are astrologists, all of those kinds of things. Most, most very, um, uh, I, I think uh, there, there, there's a group of scholars that believe probably different names were used about people that kind of did the same things that came from different countries within the Babylonian Empire. You have to understand the Babylonian Empire was swallowing other nations. That's why Daniel's there, okay? They were just literally, they were just really consuming other empires, okay? And so this is a group, the, these are the, this is the intelligentsia, this is the religious leaders, these are the people that supposedly had some kind of insight, uh, these are the people, they did, they did a great amount of studying of the stars and things like that. So you, so you just have this group that supposedly should know something. Uh, and so he calls them the Chaldeans is probably uh, a group of Babylonians that came from a, a certain Babylonian, Kadesh, uh, K I can't remember the name, so K-A-D something. And, uh, but Chaldean, a Chaldean can mean somebody in this position or it can mean a Babylonian in general. You will see the Babylonians called the Chaldeans a lot. It's kind of an interchangeable um, tag, Okay. Uh, but, but, but from Ch uh, Chaldea uh, to tell the king his dream so they came and stood before the king and the king said to him I've had a dream my spirit is anxious to know the dream in other words I can't let it go the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic O king live forever tell your servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation the king answered and said to the Chaldeans my decision is firm if you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you will be cut in pieces and your houses will be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't no fool, was he? <coughs> he knew that religious sounding people can talk the talk. And he wasn't about to have that happen. He's been watching this his whole life. His dad was a great king, Nebo, Nebo, uh, Nebopalasar. And, and Nebopalasar dealt with, with humanity. He dealt with humankind. And he understood that a lot of this group that held sway with suspicious people will say and do whatever it takes to either make whoever they're talking to sound good or make them happy or whatever. 
but he wasn't going to be fooled by a bunch of religious nonsense so he basically says this you know what you're talking about tell me what my dream was not only tell me what my dream was but tell me what it means because he was absolutely convinced it had a meaning now that would be an impossible task if you got that say i got it amen <laughs> looks impossible to me so he uh, so he says in verse 7 they answered again and said let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll give its interpretation the king said i know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm if you do not make known the dream to me there is only one decree for you you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed until something comes along that changes it something comes along that i change my mind or or, or a, an emergency comes up and i ain't got time to mess with y'all in this whatever it may be y'all ain't gonna do nothing but stall and lie make sense therefore tell me the dream and uh, I shall know that you can give me the interpretation. In other words, if you tell me what the dream is, then I'll know you know what it means because obviously you can't just pull it out of my head. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there's no other who can tell the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And for this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Basically, he says this, you know what? ain't none of y'all any count remember the investment he has just in some in some judean captives he's had three years worth of training in daniel and them these these people that have been trained they've been living off the king's table basically he says this i got a lot of good food and a lot of wine in you people and all y'all just giving me the runaround you know what i don't need any of you that's basically his his position okay so if you got that say i got it all right let's just keep reading so then uh so he is they, they sought out daniel and them verse 14 then with oh no 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 verse 12 for this reason the king was angry and very furious gave command to destroy the wise men of babylon the king it went out they began killing the wise men they sought daniel his companions i guess i was at verse 14 and with counsel and wisdom daniel answered arioch the captain of the king's guard literally the captain's executioners who had gone out to kill the wise men of babylon he answered and said to arioch the king's captain why is the decree from the king so urgent and then arioch made the decision known to daniel it says he answered him with counsel and wisdom arioch wasn't there to consult with him arioch was not there to look for people that could interpret the dream right he was there to kill anybody that had a position of being a wise man inside of babylon so daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation daniel went to his house he made the decision known to hananiah mishael and azariah who most people know shadrach meshach and abednego his companions that they might seek mercies from the god of heaven concerning this secret so daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of babylon then the secret was revealed to daniel in a night vision so daniel blessed the god of heaven and he answered and said blessed is the name of god forever for his wisdom and might are his he changes the times the season he removes kings and raises up kings he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding he reveals deep and secret things he knows what's in the darkness and light dwells with him i thank you and praise you O god of my fathers you have given me wisdom and might and to know uh, and now made known to me what uh, what we ask of you for you have made known to us the king's demand so Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said this to him. Don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. I like that about Daniel. He could have killed off all the competition. He said, don't, don't y'all stop killing them. Don't destroy them. Take me before the king. I'll tell the king the interpretation. Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king, and he said thus to him, I found a man of the captains of Judah who will make known the king the, to the king the interpretation. And old Nebuchadnezzar asked him and said, Daniel, who they called Belteshazzar, are you, able, uh, are you able to make known to me the dream of which I have seen and its interpretation? 
And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret that the king has demanded, the wise men, astrologers, magicians, soothsayers, can't declare to the king. But there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. You ought to underline that. There's a God in heaven that can get us through. Amen. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar uh, what will be in latter days. Those, these be in even our days. Your dream and the visions in your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what it'll be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes to make known the interpretation to the king that you may know the thoughts in your heart. See, the king has said, "Do you got? can you make it known? Daniel makes sure that he understands, I can't do it. There's a God in heaven who can. He said, O king, now you were watching, and behold, a great image. And that's why I asked him to put this up right here. You've got to get an idea of the, the dream, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had. Okay, I forgot I'd ask him to put that up, and thank you all for finding that for me today. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. And this great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. Its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Now you watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. That, that's probably talking about when, when all this goes to be, and broke them into pieces. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. We'll tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, which Nebuchadnezzar most definitely was. The, the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whatever the children, and, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beast of the fields, or the burst of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you a ruler over them all. You are this king, this head of gold. Pause. If you are a student of history, or even of current events, you will notice that a lot of times people and nations will rise up and it just doesn't seem to make sense the capacity that they have. A uh, Hitler rising up amongst some of the most intelligent people on the planet, the German nation, and swoops them away with nothing more than the sound of his voice. A Napoleon who rises up and becomes the scourge of Europe an Alexander the Great, who frankly, daddy was just a king of, of just one area, of Macedon. And it just seemed like with, like with Nebuchadnezzar, God jump starts the daddy and then shoots the son off like a rocket. And you see this all through history. How in the world it just seems to rise up when it so often just doesn't even make sense. This is God at work, allowing and doing. And you say, well, Brother Todd, a lot of these nations are terrible and heathen and pagan. Amen. Because God will use the rebellion of men to accomplish his will more than we think. So, you're this head of gold. Verse 39, after you will rise another kingdom inferior to yours. One of the things you need to notice as you, as you think about the, 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 just the picture that's up there or in particular as you see the Lord talk the metals become less valuable but they become stronger silver is stronger than gold bronze is stronger than silver iron is stronger than bronze iron isn't worth what bronze is bronze isn't worth what silver is silver isn't worth what gold is does that make sense? okay shall rule over the earth uh, da, 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 I missed a verse amen I got one of these Bibles I've been trying to preach from that's got the, the verse number in the middle of the paragraph so it reads easier and it's easier to read but it's a devil to preach from I can't find verse 40 when I, I need to see it over here on the left 
So the fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron in as much as iron breaks in pieces, shatters everything like iron that crushes. That kingdom will break in pieces, crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom will be divided, yet with the strength of the iron in it, and just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they won't adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. We live in the most powerful military. We have the most powerful military of any nation on the earth. But we have weaknesses that are beyond critical. Does that make sense? These are the type of nations we're talking about here, okay? As iron doesn't mix with clay, verse 44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms. It'll stand forever. And somebody ought to say amen to that. Inasmuch as you saw the stone that was cut of a mountain out with, without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain. Its interpretation is sure. In other words, this is what's going to happen. And we're going to, I'm going to briefly touch on it, so we're going to talk in detail about it next week, that exactly what God said would happen, happened what God said uh, what happened is happening now verse 46 since i've already read the whole chapter to you and it's only took us about 20 minutes the king then the king nebuchadnezzar fell on his fate prostrate before daniel commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him and the king answered daniel said truly your god is the god of god you might underline that because god is going to bring nebuchadnezzar into faith and this is this is nebuchadnezzar's first real encounter with who god is and we're going to see it because one of the books of one of the chapters of daniel is written by nebuchadnezzar it's literally a letter that he set down into history that god used and included it in, in what daniel gave us okay the king answered daniel and said truly your god is the god of gods the lord of kings and the revealer of secrets since you could reveal the secret the king promoted daniel gave him many great gifts made him ruler over the whole province of babylon so that's the home home nation the chief administrator all the, over all the wise men of babylon the men that he had saved he's now he's now in charge of all of them and daniel petitioned the king and he said shadrach meshach and abednego over the affairs of the province of babylon but daniel sat in the king of the gate so he he asked could he get them to run the province of babylon for him he's a master delegator okay let's let's talk on your outline Number one, there's Daniel's problem. Daniel had a problem, right? Verses 1 to 16. Daniel's got a problem. Uh, king's trying to kill him. Number two, you see Daniel's prayer. You see Daniel's prayer. That was the next thing we read about, okay, in verses 17 and 18. Then we see Daniel's praise. In fact, verses 19 through 23 are literally a song. It is written in the form of poetry. If you have a type Bible that, that emphasizes poetry, it probably has it broke down out into verses, okay, like your book of Psalms was. Then you see Daniel's proclamation, verses 24 through 30. You see Daniel's prophecy, number five on your outline and then you see daniel's promotion if you got all that say i got it all right now do you need me to preach over promotion do i do you need me do you not understand what happened with daniel and them god lifted them up could i put off to the side uh righteousness exalts a nation maybe you could put off to the side jesus will lift you up one of the great benefits of coming to Christ is he is a status-giving God. Everywhere Christ is preached and everywhere Christ is, is received, the, the status of that nation, that people, that family always goes up. You'll live a better life following Jesus. Amen. It's just a reality. You know, how, why? Well, one, there's just God blesses people. 
We, do, we live in a sin-cursed world, but God always looks after his own. David said, I've been old and now I've been young, but I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. Amen. Amen. Uh, another thing happens that promotes your life is when you follow Jesus, you don't do a lot of stupid stuff. Amen. <laughs> you ever notice that some things God runs on this planet, he don't necessarily say, I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. A lot of things God just lets become consequence of action. You plant corn, you get corn. You plant tomatoes, you get tomatoes. You don't plant okra and get squash. Amen? So if you, don't, if you plant good, you tend to get good. If you plant bad, you're going you're gonna to get bad. Amen? 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 You can't smoke three packs a day and be mad at God when you die of lung cancer. Amen? Some things are just cause and effect. And so the reality is some of it is just very practical. People that follow Jesus don't dog cuss each other across the dinner table. So they don't have scarred kids. And they don't have hurt kids. And what do we all know? Hurt people hurt people. Amen. And so you just, you knock down that stuff. Brother Jim and I got to visit yesterday. We was talking. He, he was feeling so good. and We were talking about different stuff was happening. I was talking about, I don't remember how it come around, but it, it come around on my dad and the peace that my, my dad had there at his ending of his life and stuff. And I was telling Brother, Brother Jim stuff about what my, how my daddy had struggled, how, what he had come out of, the ignorance and those kinds of things, uh, and the, the violence and those kinds of things. And I was talking to him, I got talking to him about my grandpa Peavy about how he was so sure enough saved, right? And there was this, this, and anyway, I was telling him stories, and Brother Jim's just sitting there going, wow, Kathy's over her eyes this big. And like, man, if we'd known this about your family, we wouldn't let you in the room, amen? Got a little nervous, right? And so, uh, you know, just the, uh, if you could have just seen back in those early 60s, these two families coming into each other, or over here, I've got my maternal grandfather who was, who was just a picture of a man trying to walk with the Lord. And he had come from people who had walked with the Lord. And then here's Grandpa Peavy over here. Where I mean, I'm talking about it's ignorant and it's mean and it's violent and they, they don't have any good way of handling anything. I mean, literally, when they would get in fights with their, each other, they just ask, are we going to fight with guns, knives, or barehanded? And this is with your own family. And then they would beat on each other until one of them needed a break. And then they'd go sit on the, on the porch and drink moonshine and beer until one of them would ask the other one, have you had enough yet? And then they'd say, no, I, need, I, I think I need a little bit more. And they'd get up and start choking each other again. And that's what, you wonder sometimes why Brother Todd says things or does things. Some of us wired into my DNA a little bit. So, but, 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 but the reality was when Grandpa Peavy came to know the Lord, Grandma said everything changed. She said, for three weeks, everybody's walking on eggshells around him, waiting on the real Floyd Peavy to show back up. He never did. And he walked in the valley of death in peace. And not that he, he didn't know he was dying when he was saved. That, that came afterwards. Grandma said, the only thing about your granddaddy dying I ever had a problem with God with, and I told him, was I had prayed all my life to have a decent man to live with, and Lord, you saved him and gave me the, the husband you wanted, and you killed him a year and a half later. And she said, I've been, you know, me and Jesus, we talked. Grandma, you had no, because they, you know how grandma was. We just talk. I figure God's big enough for what I'm thinking, you know. And, uh, uh, you know she didn't mean it in a harsh way, but, but it was like, this is things I, you know, went with. God lifts you up. Shannon, girl, your life's different since you followed Jesus than before, amen? Yeah, it's just different. It's better, okay? So you don't need me to preach on that, right? Amen. Even though I just took seven, eight minutes and did it. Okay, the prophecy itself, we're going to go get into on your outline next week. But I will say, go ahead and bring that. Is, is that screen working? You, you, you recognize Daniel sees a vision of something like a statue, as it were, an image, right? A head of gold, that's Babylon. A torso of silver, that's Medo-Persia, okay? That's the Medes and the Persians. They're coming next, and you're, you're going to see another vision that, that Daniel gives us that, that'll confirm that. The, the loins, as it were, okay, and, and the thighs are of bronze. That's Greece. That's Greece. 
in, fact, in particular under Alexander the Great. And then legs of iron, that's Rome, okay? And then the iron and clay mingled together are in particular probably one of two things and perhaps a combination of both, okay? This is the extension of Rome into the world and into the world's ideology and systems, okay? Or it is the revised Roman Empire under Antichrist. Ten toes, Antichrist leads ten nations, has a ten-nation confederacy, right? And it's probably a reality of both. One thing we do know is that Rome's influence has what has left for 2,000 years the idea on world culture. When world cultures move together, they form up under Roman ideas. They form up under Roman ideology, and they pretty much are extensions of it. When China, I believe, is a great nation. I believe China will continue to be a great nation until the Lord comes back. It's going to grow. It's going to excel. You're going to see the same thing in India and that kind of thing. But nobody in the world is moved by Chinese culture but Chinese people. They have influence where they are. But, but the West idea infiltrates every other idea. You go to Jerusalem today, they're, they're, they want to dress more like Americans than they do like Chinese people. And that's because the influence is in the West. It's not, it's not, it's, I'm not, this is not racist. This is not, this is not any kind of nationalism and all that kind of nonsense, okay? There, there's going to be somebody for Antichrist to fight, okay? And they're going to be coming from a different worldview. But you see, you see a worldview come up out of Rome and it spreads out globally. It has spread out globally, and it continues to do so, okay? It's just a fact. So we're going to talk at, at length about that. The, the, the stone cut without hands, who's that? Jesus. That's Jesus. He's, he's a stone, he's cut, but what? Without hands, no creator, okay? And he comes down, and he strikes and the day of Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon, you'll see it in fulfillment. He strikes at those feet of iron and clay and the whole world system, as it were, crumbles and becomes this chaff that blows off and he sets up a kingdom that has what kind of end? No end, right, none, okay? So this is the picture. This is a picture of where the world is moving. In Revelation, it talks about these nations and it also talked about other ones right nations which were right you know who the other two were right egypt and assyria assyria was the nation that was had all the power when jonah was 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 preaching assyria is who had destroyed the babylonians and anybody that heard when the god's prophets talking about how babylon was going to rise up all the skeptics in their day laughed just like they would laugh at me on cnn tonight Oh, that's stupid. Oh, it's a bunch of superstition. There's no way they're ever going to. Nobody could see a Nebo Palisar picking up the ashes of Babylon and turning it into a, the, the, probably the greatest world superpower the world's ever seen as opposed to what it could actually do in the world. When Nebuchadnezzar is called a king of kings, guys, you've got to understand every living person on this planet, if their army moved against it, if all he had to do was call your name for death and you were dead, there was no judge. There was no jury. He was all of it. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. It would be like somebody right now in charge of the United States, the European Union, China, and India, and Russia. And it would be like one person in charge of all of that. And if he whispered something, that's what happened. Amen? Like, I mean, me and you can talk about the president here, or there, or whenever. You can talk about it. You notice how everybody talks about him. First words out of their mouth, oh, king, live forever. I mean, they, everybody here, notice that when, 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 and we'll talk about it here in a second, when Daniel talked to the king's guard, he had to do so with wisdom and counsel because Ariok was not sent to find interpreters. So if he was going to go to the king and say, I didn't do what you said, he was taking his life in his hands right 
The same thing comes up in Persia when, when Queen Esther comes and, 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 and she says, well, if I go and I ain't been called, he's going to kill me. Now, we, it's hard for us to understand that kind of power, but that was, the, that was the power at the center of this, okay? If you got it, say, I got it. Amen. Look at somebody say, I'm glad we're going to talk about it next week. Amen. Not tonight. So that leaves us with four things, a problem, a prayer, a praise, and a proclamation. So now that we've got through the introduction, let's talk about the problem. Verse 12 specifically talks about the king's anger, right? Everybody in here understand what was going on? I got a dream. Y'all tell me the dream and what it means. We can't do that. Well, then you're all going to die. If you got that, say, got it. Amen. Amen. Secondly, there's the prophet's approach. And here we can gain something. In verse 14, it talks about Daniel moving in counsel and wisdom. How do you approach your problems? How do you approach your problems? Save person. No, no, not, not how we ought to. How do you? I'm not talking about you being saved. I, I alluded to it on Sunday, but it, for Hot Topics this year in Life Group, in, in July, August, right, we're going to bring all the Life Groups, all the adult Life Groups, going to put them right in here. And I want you, you Wednesday night people, I want you all to be ahead, okay? Gary, I don't want to be the worst version of my saved self. Does that make sense? I'm saved. And I want to be walking with God in fellowship and maturity, or I can be walking like a prodigal son. Does that make sense, brother? Brother Newmeyer? Still ain't got used to you without your beard, man. I almost, almost said, sister, what are you doing sitting beside this guy? I don't want to be the worst version of my saved self. I want to be growing. I don't want to just be existing. I don't want to just be doing better with the problems I used to have. I don't want my addictions managed. I want them broken. How do you handle your problems? Look at Daniel counsel wisdom he recognizes problems are gonna come hard times are gonna come which way are we gonna step when we step in difficulty i did a victory minute today put a little little commercial for it i alluded to it a little bit on on sunday about how I started off, because I started off saying, I, I real almost disqualified myself this week, okay? Now, it wasn't in some, somebody, somebody said, bro, they're going to think you had a, some girlfriend or something, or some woman or something. You go, go listen to the sermon if you think that. You quit listening. It was, it was an opportunity for wrath. It was an opportunity for me to bust some kneecaps is what it was, okay and i mean to the point of just on the edge of losing my temper but i didn't but i didn't and i talked in the victory minute today about the process i used the the counsel and the wisdom things that god's given me i got away i shut my mouth i don't need anything coming in when i don't know what to do yet i'm not at a point of seeking counsel And I'll tell you who will make sure you got counsel when you ain't ready for counsel is the devil. And you don't, because you don't need to speak words in pride and you don't need to speak words that you're going to have to back up later. Because if I go to popping off at the mouth to Ross and I'll tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this. And then when I decide not to do it, but maybe I thought Ross going to think I crawfish and my pride will get me. You shut your mouth. You refuse the plan. You want to escape temptation? You want to overcome temptation? You want to to keep your temptation to turn into sin? You turn the back of the page over, I'll give you a secret to life. Refuse to plan. 
You think about something long enough, you'll do it. David would have been fine being tempted. Jesus was tempted. But somewhere between he saw Bathsheba and he called for Bathsheba, he decided on a plan. Don't plan. And sure don't plan your sin. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You get to think, especially if, you, if you're battling anger, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. And they're going to say this, and I'm going to say that. And, oh, and if they do that, then I'm going to. And before you know it, even if you don't act, you've lost the whole day. Uh, and you ain't done nothing but give yourself an ulcer. Huh? Have any of you ever gotten yourself madder than you were? You're mad, but then you go to talking and planning, and you get worse. And the Lord was telling me that whole afternoon, stop it. Stop it. And I'm like, Lord, I'm, I, we, I, Lord keep me from planning. But I tell you what, Lord, if right, right, you refuse to plan and you wait on a word. You get a word from God, and then you can act. And those are the only things, those steps are the things that kept it brought me back to a point of where I recognize I got a word from God, I'm at peace with God, I'm in fellowship with God, and then when I go to seek counsel, I'm gonna get confirmation. There's safety in a multitude of counselors. Amen. But you only counsel with people you know have your best interest at heart. You never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever in your life type in on Facebook, what do y'all think I ought to do? Amen. You'd be better off going to Terrell State Hospital and walking into one of the rooms and saying, hey, what you guys think? Yep. Miserable people love misery. And I'll guarantee you any, any place like that will always produce a set of advice that will cause you more strife than blessing. Amen? Amen? Amen. And you say, well, it's my mama. Listen, if your mama's ungodly, don't talk to her about nothing. You can love her. You can take care of them, but you ain't got to listen to them about stuff that matters. I'm telling you, if I, if I perceive that somebody's ungodly, I don't listen to them even if they want to talk to me. I can be nice. Hey, hey, amen, amen, amen. Well, hey, ooh, is that my phone ringing? I don't know. I got to go. I felt some buzz in my pocket. <laughs> you know? <laughs> kind of like when you, you tell your admin, in five minutes, you call me. <laughs> I got a phone call coming in, and I ain't lying because it's ringing. Amen. No. You know, y'all know what I'm saying. I don't do junk like that. But not that I don't think about it. <laughs> Not that I don't, I've always thought God Amber to call me right now. Anyway, okay? But do you see what I'm saying? God has given us process. He's given us tools. Every time something bad happens, I don't go get snot rolling drunk anymore. Why? Because God's given me tools. And I can operate in them and I can believe in them and God will prove them out. Amen? You ain't got to do like the world does. You ain't got to be the worst version of your saved self. We're going to be talking about in that deal about transforming. Not being conformed, but being transformed. And then looking into the tools God has given us. Because that's from Romans 12. What is the primary topic in Romans 12? Off the top of your head. He talks about it more than anything else. You know Romans 12. Be, don't be conformed to this world, right? But be transformed by the remnant, right? What's the number one thing he talks about all through the, the rest of the chapter? Nope. Gifts. The gifts. These are the things God has given us because God wants us to will and to do his good pleasure. If you got it, say, I got it. Amen. So notice his approach. Secondly, then notice his action. Oh, when trouble's up, you got to act. If you'll, uh, I, this ain't a place for this on your outline, but if you want to write them down, you can. Here's three words that start with the letter S, or three phrases that start with the letter S. Maybe you want to notice that he sees the moment. Very seldom do great inconveniences come up at a convenient time. And you've got to be walking in enough understanding and counsel and wisdom so that you comprehend your moment and recognize that an attack can be is just that an attack 
and that you're ready for it. It's why it's so important to daily walk with God. It's why it's so important to have your prayer life. And all. it's kind of like I was talking about Brother Jim a while ago. His 28-year-old daughter died of a brain aneurysm in her sleep one night. And Brother Jim had got up and had his prayer, had already went to the hospital and came back. And Kathy had woke up and was, they were extra. Brother Jim's a very much an early goer. And a uh, little Christian is five years old at the time, walks in the door and says, Mama won't wake up and her nose is bleeding. And she passed away from an aneurysm. And like Jim says, and right then, we're in your moment. You're in the moment. And you don't have time to get prayed up because you're dealing with the situation as it is. My phone brings in text and phone calls at any given time could change the whole course and direction of this whole church. And it happens at an instant. I just glanced over and saw Gary, and the first thing I thought of was when Nick called me and said, Brother Todd, are you around the office? Yes, matter of fact, I am. And he was watching what had happened with Grady on the cameras at the house. And just like that, you don't know what a day's going to bring forth. Right, Nan? Bless your heart. You just don't know. So he seizes the moment. Secondly, he shares the situation. He got other praying people involved. God uses us as a body, even like what I was talking about earlier. The next thing I'm going to do is go out and get counsel. I have counselors in my life in this church and outside of this church. I got counselors in my life that are ahead of me, as it were, in the walk with Christ and got more time and experience in it the older men I got younger men I got guys my age I've even got a few old church mothers that I'll talk to now I don't go around talking to young women that kind of stuff's not appropriate but but we we share this walk um, brother, can I tell you something? You, you husbands, your wife ain't as much a nag as you think. A lot of what she's looking for, not only from her end, is intimacy, but you need it. You need to be able to talk about how you feel. You need to be able to talk about what you're thinking. You can't just hold it all inside. You, you can't live as an island in this world. It's, it needs to be shared. There needs to be people that can speak into your life and can speak to God on your behalf. Now, I am the world's worst about not letting anybody know when something's going on. But I have scolded a many a Christian. How can I pray for you if I don't know? You ain't got to tell us all the details. But at least we need to know to be praying. Amen. 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 You need to have people you pray with. And you say, Brother Todd, I don't have nobody I know well enough to pray with. Well, start praying with people, and you'll figure out real quick the ones you can hang around with and the ones that you need to get away from. Amen. Amen. Look at somebody and say, don't get away from me. <laughs> Amen. I want you to be close. And then, of course, and then, of course, he started praying. And you got to start there. You got to start with prayer. Um, don't talk to anybody about anything until you've talked to God about everything. Amen. 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 Somebody write that down. That make a good sermon title. All right. If you got all that, say, I got it. So notice that Daniel's prayer, well, his prayer was his activity. Prayer was his activity when he was facing an impossibility. Two kinds of things are going to come at you in life, things you can do something about and things you can't do anything about. The Bible from start to finish tells us don't worry, don't fret, right? One whole psalm about just don't fret. When you can do something, you need to act. Okay? Make sense? The problem is a lot of things happen in life or, or beyond our capacity. That's where your prayer life comes in. And it is in that fellowship of prayer where you go to the God who doesn't know impossibilities. Amen? That you can have peace. Because dying is an impossibility. You don't know what's going to happen as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. 
I can still see my daddy looking at me with his gray eyes and saying, what's this going to be like? And I looked at him and said, Daddy, I don't know, but I know God will be with you. But I know that because I don't know. I don't know what you're about to face. I don't know how the walk is going to be for you. And, you know, and none of us want that. But how do, you, how do you live in moments where it's impossible? Because some things are outside of your power. Amen? Amen. And that's where, you're, that's where that fellowship comes in. And any time I, this is me, I'll give you this if it'll help you in your life. I am a big believer in, I speak to the Lord, and then there's a time for me to believe the Lord. But I will go back in prayer every time I feel anxious. I may be standing there in the hospital and I may not be saying anything specifically to God about the situation, though we always pray, amen. Men are always to pray and not to faint. We're in that fellowship. But if I feel anxious, fearful, nervous, then I make that a matter of conscious prayer. Does that make sense? And some of y'all been with me in hospitals. Y'all don't, y'all, I don't run around preacher typing it in hospitals. I don't run around, a bunch of holy talk, this and that. Ain't no time for it. Sometimes time's better to be shut up than it is to be talking. But there's a time to talk. And when you see somebody that, that you're there for is getting anxious, or you are getting anxious, or people around you are getting anxious, then, then that's when you pray. And I'm telling you, prayer will drive anxiety out of your life. And a lot of people go, oh, Brother Todd, I know I ought to pray, but do you got to drop the but. And because praying is one of those things we know to do, but we so seldom will do. And then, of course, you notice his agreement, right? He's praying with these other guys where two or three are gathered together. Don't be afraid to bring other people into your impossibilities. Uh, Two are better than one. A threefold cord's not easily broken. Um, God's made us to be part of a body. He's made us to be part of a family. Uh, we are a band of brethren, as it were. And, um, and there is strength, uh, 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 weakness, a fear shared uh, loses a whole lot of its weight. Um, uh, two's the number of witness. If I'm with another believer, I'm three times the witness I am on my own. It's just something about you being there praying. It's just knowing that if we get beat up, me and you getting beat up together. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Ain't that right, Adam? And you're like, you know what, man? Hey, I tell you what, brother. They about to whoop. You know, why don't they just whoop us both instead of just one of us? Amen. Now, if you want to take the hit for me, that's okay. Because you know, I'm scared, brother. But anyway, if you got all that, say I got it. Then you get to Daniel's praise. Verses 19 through 23. And if you want to spend a little fun time with the Lord, Take a few moments this week and, and study through those verses. Uh, you want to learn how to praise God? Daniel's pretty good at it. But let me give you this. He, he praises God beginning about verse 20 for the person of God, for who God is. Notice he talks about the name of the Lord. God wants us to know him. And God is... Uh, it is an amazing thing who God has made himself towards us. If I need a defender, he's my advocate. Amen. If I need a guide, he's my bishop. If I need a covering, he's my cleft. If I don't know my way, he's my day spring. When I, when I don't know about tomorrow, he's the everlasting father, right? When I ain't got no faith, he's the finisher of faith, right? When I don't know the way, he's a good master, amen? When I'm under attack, he's a hiding place from a wind, Isaiah 32 said, Amen. So the name of the Lord, he praises the name of God forever and ever. Number two, he praises God for the possessions of the Lord. Notice in verse 20, he says that the Lord has wisdom and might. He knows what to do, and he can pull it off. He knows what to do, and he gives us the power to pull it off. When we walk in fellowship with the Lord... There is such a confidence in knowing what to do and knowing that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. I don't have the power, but God can make a way where there seems to be no way. Thirdly, he praises God for the program of God, for the Lord's program. Two things he talks about here. 
he talks about how the Lord moves these kingdoms and these countries around it's easy to look at history and look at all the nonsense of mankind and go oh my God where's the Lord but if you'll see his word and you know his word and then you look back over it you see his hand moving and shaping things towards its end sometimes using the righteous and sometimes using the unrighteous I'm a, I'm a big history fan I'm a big military history fan I love studying the battles that don't make any sense Nebuchadnezzar as his daddy's general at the time crushing the Egyptians should have never happened Alexander the Great against the Persians there are battles there you understand there were times that the Persians brought a million men a million men is an impossible situation now could you imagine then when large armies had 50 100,000 in them and the Persians are marching around with more than a million men I'm talking about for the fight I don't mean people back there cooking and stuff I'm talking about people with swords in their hands and chair it, it's just if you watch God move his hand in history there are so many things and so many times where it just doesn't make sense Hitler doesn't press the battle of Britain he gets mad because two aimless guys <laughs> two English guys and a bomber got lost in the night didn't want to come back with their bombs saw some lights said I think that's it and dropped their bombs where on Berlin and Hitler got so mad about it he pulled all the all the Luftwaffe's attack against the British Air Force and they started bombing the cities because we'll teach you and what he didn't know but God knew James is that the English Air Force was at its breaking point. They couldn't have took two more days of losing an airfield. Weird stuff like that. Lee doesn't press his victory at Bull Run. And things like that, where that don't even make sense. A bunch of fishing boats getting them English boys off Dunkirk. And, and, and when you, and you say, Brother Todd, what, what does this mean? I mean, guys, if you'll just look at history, you will see from the Battle of Carchemish and places like that where it's just like this, half of Alexander the Great's battles make no sense whatsoever. But God had already ordained that Medo-Persia is going to fall to Greece. And it was going to divide. We're going to see it. Greece is going to divide into four places just like it happened in Alexander's day 300 years later how it all divided Alexander didn't have kids and it divided amongst his, uh, his generals and you're going to see even down to the battles between uh, Antony and Scipio and all of them playing out it's just God's moving it one rises another comes things move in and you can see it to this day. You can see it to this day. The second thing is you not only see God's hands here in, in the kingdom, but, but you, see, you see him in the Christian. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. I want to tell you something. If you can look at this world today and go, this is a delusion. This is delusional. If you have that capacity, it's because God's give it to you. These things are spiritually discerned. But you understand that most of the people running around on this planet think the greatest thing they'll ever do is get rid of a gas stove and keep abortion available and think they're doing the world a favor. So you see the program of God, then you see, of course, the position of God. He reveals the deep and secret things he knows what's in the darkness and light dwells with him I was reading that and all I could think of is he dwells in the light but he knows what's in the dark <laughs> and wherever he shows up he, 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 there's nothing going on that's a secret to God and everywhere the Lord goes there's light and then of course he praises God that his petitions were answered 
by God. I thank and praise you, O God, and my fathers. You've given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what I ask of you. I just I wrote this to myself. Be, make sure you tell God thank you when he, when he tells you yes. When he gives you what you ask for. I think of them, them, them lepers. And while they were going, they were healed, and one of them turned back and gave God thanks. A Samaritan remember Jesus said we're not we're not ten here we're at a nine and nobody come back to give the Lord thanks except this stranger it ought not be so in the house of God Amen, you ought to take time to be thankful if, if you can live in an attitude of gratitude it'll keep you from Eve's sin Eve got her eyes on everything she didn't have, put her eyes on everything, the one thing she didn't have, and took her eyes off everything God had given her. And, and we, can, we can do that. Americans are too depressed for us to understand this. We have so much, and yet it's what we don't have that drives us. And, um, I mean, honestly, y'all, our little sister Hillary, his home getting over a one of them you start out a day and the next thing you know your whole life's different because there's is now and thank god she's okay and had a little surgery and come back home but even when i started in ministry what happened with her we'd be planning her funeral but now you're just home next day and to pause and to say thank you an attitude of gratitude for your family your food you say the blessing right you say the blessing right yes, even in restaurants right yeah. Yeah. say the blessing say the blessing it's a witness to people on the outside it instructs your children but more than anything it, it it causes us in the most normal part of day to remember god has brought us this far amen amen, amen. it's a it's an important thing so you see that and then you see his proclamation and it's eight twenty right at it so let me just note quickly in verse 27 daniel points out in verse 28 he points toward and in verse 30 he points away now what I mean by he points out in verse 27 he points out that all these false teachers you've been listening to ain't able he points that out Luke find verse 27 with me Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said the secret which the king has demanded the wise men the astrologers the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare it to the king there ain't nothing wrong with pointing out when something ain't no good Amen. notice he doesn't do it in a belligerent way but he does point it out we live in a world today that doesn't want anything pointed out You know, I'm, I've been saying for years, praise God, one of these days they're going to be throwing us in jail for what we, they're calling hate speech more and more. But they're getting serious about this. I've had to kind of ask the Lord, you know, Lord, I don't really want to go to jail. <laughs> I'm not going to back off. Amen. There's nothing wrong with pointing out an error. Now, Christian, a word fitly spoken, how good it is. You, can, you can't, don't turn somebody off to what you got to say before you ever get to what matters by how you say it amen be wise be wise but you do sometimes have to point out yeah but thinking like that's what got you to this point amen okay secondly he points towards and by of course what you see by that is he points everything to the lord there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He's made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream, your visions of your head and on your bed. As for you, O king, he goes to tell him what it is. Right? 
He points it towards the Lord. One of the worst things a Christian can do is take credit for a gift God's given him. Amen. 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 And, it, and it happens with us. You got you to gotta re recognize as a Christian, just because you've been saved a while doesn't mean you can't fall into a trap. And, and, and one of the things that will happen is, is you, you, you mistake the gifts that God has given you with a maturity that you've produced in yourself or a capacity that you have. Um, th they're, they're just the results of what God has given us. Amen. Amen. Amen? So take everything and always point it to the Lord and don't do it in a fake way. T take, be humble, okay? And that's the next thing you notice. He, verse 30, he points things away from himself. He comes back and he makes sure Nebuchadnezzar knows it's not him. But as for me, this secret hadn't been revealed to me because I got more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who have made known this interpretation to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. As for me, ain't nothing special about me, Daniel says, but God has given me this, and he lives humbly. And I will tell you something, that this world takes for granted, but loves deeply. And that is an honest, humble life. An honest, humble approach. If you can approach things with humility, you very seldom will turn people off. And if you've not turned them off, Jesus may very well turn them on. Amen? Every one of you know prideful Christians, and you don't like them. Well, how much more somebody outside the kingdom? I'm telling you, if you'll be humble, God will use you. And what I mean by humility, of course, obviously, you're not thinking too much of yourself but you're not thinking too little of yourself. It's just you, you, don't, you don't think of yourself. And, and Daniel said, God gave us this for our sakes. These people you was out trying to kill, amen. And God, and God gave it, but he, but he deflects things away from himself and towards the Lord. If you got all that, say, I got it. Bow your head with me tonight. Before we turn into the ways of life, If you're out there online or you're in here, I just I, I need to, I never take anybody's salvation for granted. I know we've been mainly talking tonight about things that as they pertain to believers, but the most important thing in the world is to be a believer. Amen. And and the reality of some of the things we've talked about, capacities and gifts, are things that we don't have until we know the Lord. These things are spiritually discerned, understood. The Bible says. And so, if there's never been a time where God's ever saved you, you know there's never been a time where you've actually really called upon him to be your lord and your savior then i want to give you an opportunity to do that the bible says you do it by by belief the bible says you do it in repentance the bible says you do it in in confession okay whoever calls on the name of the lord will be saved to believe enough to act even to the point of repenting turning in our direction and turning to the lord will bring salvation into your life if you're online you're out there wherever however you're watching me tonight just just pause and pray and ask the Lord to save your soul. It can be as simple or as intricate as your prayer wants, needs to be, but you just talk to the Lord honestly, express trust in him and faith towards him, repentance of sin, and a desire to follow him, and the Lord will give you the answer. Uh, he will answer your prayer in a positive way because it's him that's given you understanding to do it anyway. And if you're in this room, and there's never been a time where you've asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior, and you would like for somebody to talk to you after this service, and my invitation to you tonight is going to be this. In a minute, I'm going to count to three and say go. And when I do, if, if you'll raise your hand, what you're saying to me is it's okay if somebody comes and talks to me. It's okay if one of the pastors comes and talks to me about my salvation. Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you've never asked, whatever it may be, okay? But all you're doing by raising your hand is saying it's okay for somebody to come to me and talk to me about my soul, okay? So one, two, three, go. Is there anybody? But I thought it'd be okay if somebody would come talk to me after church about my soul, about my salvation. I want to make certain tonight that I'm saved. I always want to give you an opportunity. You always have an opportunity at this church. If you're online, you always have an opportunity. you got questions, call us. Phone number will be coming up, 469-838-5321. Be sure and put a plus one on it if you're outside of America. And, um, and give us a holler. And we do, we do anything we can to help you um, have the peace of salvation in your life. If you've prayed, be sure and contact us through that number or the website. 
And if we can do anything for you, we'll sure try to do it wherever you are. We got one of our brethren headed to India here in a month uh, to help Christians there. So whatever it takes, we'll, we'll do everything we can to get to you and help you. Dear Heavenly Father, dismiss us from this place. Give us power and peace to live out these truths, these realities that Daniel walked in. Give us understanding, Lord, if we get to, if you tear your coming and bring us back next week to just look at how powerful you are, how great you are. And Lord, as you have moved through these world systems. And Lord, we thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a good night. Have a good rest of the week. And bring somebody to church with you on Sunday.